These elites, large banks and companies and technology exports. <laughs> Russia unleashing an assault on Ukraine from multiple directions. And after a fierce battle, Ukraine lost control of Chernobyl, the site of the world's worst nuclear disaster. Yama, The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Much that once was, is lost, for none now live who remember it. Welcome to Red Baron Reviews. I'm Baron, and today we are taking a look at this Russian Tula TT33. But first, let's go over some of the kit so I can take it off because it is hot today. So starting with the rifle, we have a Romanian SAR-1. I've got a Armacon Russian flash hider on it. I've got some Polish wood furniture, Magpul PMAG, a ALG trigger. Um, I think this is a U.S. Palm fake light grip. RPK stock. Then we are running a RS Regulate mount, primary arms 3 power with the kill flash. That's the rifle out of the way. Separate review coming. As far as the kit goes, I'm running a Russian belt rig. I'll put the specifics in there with the harness. Um, we've got the harness mag pouches. I have done a review on these. I've got a K bar a canteen, canteen cup, and pouch. The same style butt pack that comes with the Smursh from SSO. We got a IFAC and more mag pouches. And another re review to come on this specifically. OCP issued pants, OCP issued top. I've got a Russian IR patch. Uh, blood type, which yeah, I know it probably doesn't go up here. It's just for the video, right? Um, I've got one mechanic glove. I've got one EXO glove, a issued, well, at least a AR compliant boonie that I've modified, cut the burn back, put a piece of wire in here, um, and then the balaclava, this is a, or neck gator, this is a condor. So, that is the gear in a nutshell, and then of course, the TT33. Now, this one. It was made in 1941, and it is kind of rough. I know that the light's kind of starting to suck right now, but 
it's rough. I mean, as you saw from the video, it is rough. However, it is all numbers matching. There is no import mark, and I think this gun probably has a really cool history if it can tell us. So for those who are unaware, we're going to talk about the TT-33 from like a high altitude, 30,000 foot view. We're not going to get too far into the weeds, but we'll just cover the basics. So this pistol was designed around 1930. I think development started in the 20s. It became the TT-30. They made some adaptations in the TT-33, which is what this is. This is very similar to a lot of the Browning pattern handguns of the day, like the 1911, the 1903, both of which this took a lot of notes from. Uh, the difference being the hammer trigger group, I guess it'd be the hammer assembly, is a one unit piece that's easy to pull out and replace. And should you need to work on it, it's actually fairly easy to work on. It has a tilting barrel. It is chambered in 762 by 25. This holds eight rounds of it in the magazine. If you wanted to, you could carry one in the chamber. However, I do not think that that was uh, standard doctrine back in the day. Uh, these pistols serve from 1930 on up until presently in some countries. Maybe not so much in Russia, but these have popped up in Ukraine on both sides. There's some Middle Eastern countries that still carry these as a frontline pistol, uh, whether it be police or military. So they're really neat. It's got your standard kind of blade style sights. This version has the scalloped style serrations. However, later ones had more of a uh, closely serrated type like the Romanians and the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese, I believe, kind of went at an angle depending on which model you got. They made these in 9mm. They made these in 762 by 25 um, I have seen some copies made even in 30 Luger. <coughs> so those are uncommon, but they're out there. So this gun is widespread, been seen and used around the world. This was one of my very, not this particular gun, but one of my very first handguns was a Tokarev in 9mm. And so it has a very uh, near and dear place to me. And I really like shooting these. They're really slim. 7.62x25 has good ballistics. I actually prefer it over 9mm. Uh, only downside is over time it can kind of beat the gun apart, but you would have to shoot thousands upon thousands of rounds through it. Uh, generally, the Romanian ones and a lot of the Chinese and other ones are going to be in really good condition. The Polish ones to date have been the most high quality that I have seen personally or owned personally. Uh, the Polish ones look very much like these. Of course, the maker marks are a little bit different and they're going to be later produced like in the 50s. Because <coughs> at the time, Poland had their own sidearms and different chamberings. So with that, I'm going to put five rounds in it. I'm going to do my best to shoot a decent grouping. I'm by no means a pistol shooter. Never have been. But let's see what we can do. We're at about seven yards here. The first three rounds are SMB. The last two are Winchester. All full metal jacket. And it did not lock open on the last round, which is okay. This gun is old. It's worn. It has the best trigger I've ever felt on one. Um, but you'll notice that the hammer did follow that home that last round. Things are kind of worn out on this. This is not one that I'm going to shoot very much. I've got a Romanian one that I can put rounds through. I really just wanted this for the collection. So let's see how we grouped. So not great, but at seven yards, I don't know, maybe two and a half, three inch group. Not terrible. Um, especially using mixed matched ammo. And on this particular variant, I'll try to show it. The bore is kind of rough. The rifling, I should say. So I'll take the camera here so we're not flagging anybody but me. It's empty anyway. Not that I can shoot you through this. But let's see if it'll focus. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. The rifling's rough, is what I'm getting at. But all in all, really cool gun. The trigger's nice on them. It's single action. This is kind of like the Eastern European 1911. Um, or as uh, Brandon Herrera on his YouTube channel said, it's like the boomer, the Eastern boomer 1911, right? This is the boomer gun of Eastern Europe. So, really cool guns. With that, let's delve into the history that this specific gun most likely has. 
So with that, let's talk about the holster, which is going to be, other than the intro, the most controversial part. We've got the holster came with. Now, the gun, I think most of you watching this video are pretty familiar with what this is. It's a 762 by 25 uh, World War II Russian sidearm, right? This served with the Nagant revolver and um, served very well. Troops liked it. It's a good caliber to have. That 762 by 25 has a lot of ass behind it. Um, so as far as penetrating through multiple layers, whether it be wool coats in their winter time, or um, I mean, even up to, I think, 3A body armor, if my memory serves, at least a full metal jacket, it's a very capable cartridge um, and fairly mildly uh, recoiling. It does throw fireballs. That's just part of it. But the gun really doesn't recoil too bad. I, I really like the toe grabs. This is not my first one. However, it's my first Russian one. So there's nothing really unique about this gun other than it's just worn. But the holster is the mystery. So when I bought the gun, I basically paid for just the gun. The fact that it came with this holster was just a bonus. And, and in my mind, I was thinking the gun's a little high priced. If I have to, I can sell these badges individually and make the money back to where I'm in this for a reasonable price. Well, I got to looking at it and I don't think this is faked. So this holster is what's known as the universal holster. They used them for both the Nagant revolvers and the uh, Tokarevs, the TT-33s and TT-30s. Real basic holster. Now this one has had some modification and, uh, you know, probably a battlefield repair done to it. But it's a universal type holster. Uh, generally, you'll see these TT-33s with a specific holster for that gun. So the fact that it comes with this earlier type of universal holster kind of makes it, in my mind, more authentic, especially for a 1941. In addition to that, we've got these Nazi badges, right? And so this one is a um, assault badge. Uh, this one in particular is for, like, the uh, Panzer troops. Maybe not a tanker specifically, but somebody like with maybe uh, mobile field artillery, um, the mobile field guns, things like that. We're supporting personnel for that. The Totenkopf here is the same thing. That's going to be, like, your Panzers, your armored divisions. Um, the Epulet is going to be from an NCO or officer, most likely an NCO. And then you've got the Iron Cross. So at first I thought it's probably just faked because a holster setup like this is a collector's dream, right? And if this would have had papers and an actual story documenting it, that'd be even better. But we don't have that, so I've got to try to determine where this came from. Now, in World War II, the Russians had a very strict denazification program, as did the other countries, but in Russia, more so. Troops were not allowed to have things with swastikas on them, uh, not even as war trophies. Now, of course, they still took them back. They still did. That's going to happen regardless of the military that you're in. But as an NCO or an officer, you would not be walking around with a holster like this. That would not happen. Uh, you would probably be beat or killed for that. Um, so... I don't think that this came from a Russian soldier or officer. I think more likely this probably came from like a partisan fighter. Reason being is they were not an organized military. Uh, they may have had military experience, but they were not a file and rank army. Partisans are also kind of notorious for being brutal. I think if somebody was going to take a war prize and show it off, it would be a partisan or a resistance fighter. Another reason I think that this is real and not fake, other than that these awards and accessories here are all from the same type of troop, and the holster being what it is, is that these have been on here for a long time. Now, I don't know if the light's going to pick that up, but there's corrosion, it's worn in, it's formed around the pins and badges, and it might be hard to see but the badge has actually been kind of formed to the holster, like it's been pushed up against something while it's been worn. I don't think somebody's going to take the time to fake it, especially not on a gun like this. If it was a Luger or something like that, I could see somebody faking something to make it more valuable. But these, especially back 10, 15, 20 years ago, weren't worth hardly anything. Um, people wanted the German guns or the American guns, Japanese guns not so much the Russian stuff. And so these have definitely been on here for a long time. And adding these on there back then wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to increase the value in this. 
Not only that, I didn't pay for the holster. I paid for the gun. So I don't think that somebody would take the time to fake this because it didn't give them any monetary gain. Um, and then in addition, these have been on here for a long time. Like I mentioned, the guns weren't worth that much that long ago. I don't know why somebody would take the time to do this. So in my mind, this didn't belong to a Russian soldier or officer. It belonged to a partisans member or a resistance fighter. The question is, how did it get to the United States? And that's what leaves me scratching my head. So, really interesting gun, really neat. I just don't know how it got here. If you guys might know how this pistol made it into the country, please drop it down in the comments. Or if you think you know the particular history of this or most likely what this handgun's gone through, let me know. I'm still learning, and one of the ways that we learn is from each other. So please drop a comment down, like, share, subscribe, click all the buttons. That stuff's really cool. We're almost to 1,000 subscribers. And guys, maybe I'll get a camera, a real camera, and some good audio equipment someday. But in the meantime, and most importantly, as always, stay free. The kids are screaming in the background. If you've made it this far and you haven't burned me down in the comments over the intro yet, let's talk about the intro. So I think that the general population in the West and the East will never truly understand what's going on in Ukraine. And I think that those who are there actually fighting it are probably more concerned about what's immediately important to them for their survival and to get things back to normal. So I don't think we'll ever understand the true political and military complexity of the Ukrainian situation. It's just not meant for us to know at this point. What I do believe is that war is fought over two things, and that is profit and power, or both. Now people are going to say, now wait a second, what about morality and principle and those things? No. I think that there's two groups of people that suffer the most in war, and that's the civilian population and the soldiers. And on both sides sometimes. These are the people who fight for morality and principles and family and kin and country, and it's very honorable. And I don't discount any of those people or the things that they have done to uphold those things. So this video is by no way meant to degrade those people. What it is meant to do is to make you think about the nuances of the Ukrainian conflict, the little details, the sideline things that people may not catch necessarily. And in this case, it's the Azov group. We know that pre-invasion and post-invasion, pictures have surfaced of them in Nazi attire, swastikas, SS symbols, other Germanic symbols, uh, tattoos, banners, flags, uniforms, those type of things. It's a fact. It's out there. Is it widespread? I don't know. Is it just a couple of guys? Maybe. Is it total propaganda? Could be. But it's an interesting thought exercise because the last time my pistol was probably used in a duty application was to fight fascism. And it could have very well been in Ukraine against the Ukrainian SS kind of cool to think that that could have happened. It's also a really interesting thing, and it's just kind of morbid, but to think about it like this. These Tokarevs that are being pulled off the shelves and dusted off for service in 2022 could, be, could potentially be facing the same type of ideological enemy that they fought 80 years ago, which just goes to show that those who do not know their history are destined to repeat it. Now, let's just hope that that's where the similarities stop and that this conflict doesn't get any closer to what World War II was. And let's hope that it ends soon. I think that's enough about talking about this on this channel. This is not meant to be a political channel. This is not meant to be um, a super deep dive on current events around the world. But I think that we need to take a look at things that are going on around us and look at the human cost of what those are. And that requires putting yourself in the shoes of others. So enough with all this philosophy bullcrap. Enjoy the videos to come. If you guys like what you saw, give me a thumbs up. If you don't, dislike it and go on your way. I don't really care. And uh, as always, guys, stay free.